He has risen. He has risen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Welcome to the Holden Beach Chapel. If there's any visitors, would you please raise your hand so we can recognize you here? There's some up here in the front, some over there in the front. Raise your hand high. We've got a little sticker we're going to give you. What, did the bus unload you guys in the back there? <laughs> Holy cow. Keep your hand up so we can get you a sticker. That's it. Don't put them down. Oh, my gosh. The Greyhound bus must have pulled into Holden Beach this morning. Keep your hands up over there. We welcome you to Holden Beach, and happy Easter to all of you. I'm going to go ahead and continue with some announcements, but if you haven't had a sticker, make sure you got your hand raised, if you would. The chapel office is going to be closed tomorrow through the observance of Easter holiday, so it'll be closed. We're also in the process, we're going to have a yard sale on April the 22nd. So if you want to bring anything to donate to the yard sale, you can bring that in on this coming Tuesday from 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Just bring it on into the chapel, it'll go back in the overflow room, and uh, you can bring those things that you'd like to get rid of or whatever you want to do. Uh, you don't have to worry about coming back and uh, picking them up because uh, everything that's not sold at the yard sale, somebody is going to take it. So it will be put to good use as well. The Red Cross is going to be holding their Holden Beach blood drive uh, here at the chapel on Thursday, April the 27th. April the 27th for blood bank. Uh, you can go on the Red Cross website, if you would, and you can make your uh, registration there. And that's where you'll be doing that. So we welcome all of you here. Everybody, I think we just give everybody a sticker today. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord God, you love this world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that we might be called your children too. Lord, help us to live in the gladness and grace of Easter Sunday every day. Let us have hearts of thankfulness for your sacrifice. Let us have eyes that look upon your grace and rejoice in our salvation. Help us to walk in that mighty grace and tell your good news to the world. All of your glory do we pray, Lord. Amen. And if you would turn, please stand in hymn number 194. Turn to the back of your hymnal with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, he sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Whichever way you feel comfortable, please greet the people next to you. Happy Easter.
Good morning again. Today's scripture lessons come from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. And you might find those in the Pew Bible on page 1567. To better understand today's liturgy, I suggest that you read Acts 10 from the beginning. For example, in today's liturgy, Peter is speaking to a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius and his family were devout believers and God-fearing. They were hungry to know more about God, and God prepared the way through visions and angels to both Cornelius and to Peter. Fast forward, and ultimately, Peter travels to Caesarea to meet with Cornelius. But why did Peter even talk to Cornelius? Peter begins his message having just experienced his own vision, which convinced him that his previous assumption about God were no longer valid. His whole sermon proceeds from what is now a new confession that God is bringing salvation to the Gentiles. Now hear these words. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened through the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John the Baptist preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he, in the, in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, they killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by the witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now if you would join me please and prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for this another glorious, wonderful Easter Sunday. Almighty God, on this day we lift our hearts up to you in praise and thanksgiving for all the good gifts around us, knowing that they are sent from heaven above. As we count our blessings and acknowledge your goodness, our hearts go out to those who do not have and who are in need. We thank you for family and friends who love us and care for us and pray that you would befriend those who are alone. May we live in a spirit of gratitude to you and generosity to our neighbor. Keep us focused on you and your wonders that surround us. Father, bless and help us to help ourselves, to help those that have lost loved ones, those that are sick and shut in, those that are less fortunate than we, and all the little children of the world. Father, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those
Listen to the hammer as it rains on Calvary. The nails that held him captive liberated me. You might say I'm callous so when you see the joy in me. But every nail was broke by God and taken willingly. Listen to the hammering and rejoice. His touch was oh so tender, now his hands are made, and those feet that travel over rough and dusty roads, now are bloody by the nails that my Jesus chose.
us pray. All good gifts come from you, dear Lord, and from these riches we bring this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your purpose in this place and for the benefits of those in need. Amen. You may be seated. John 20, 1 through 18. Early, on the first day of the week while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he might be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to join with the chairman of our trustees, Bob Bayless, and welcome you to this service today. And at the same time, I want to apologize for this voice. <clears throat> I've had this um, uh, laryngitis for a few days, and so I have taken everything under the sun to try to get rid of it because I know that if you leave a cold alone, you're going to have it for two weeks. But if you'll treat the symptoms, you can sometimes shorten it to 14 days. <laughs> and so I have been trying to do that with limited success. But at any rate, we're glad that you're here on this day, on this very special day, the most holy day of the year, actually. And I notice we have lots of visitors, and I don't know where your home is, but wherever it is, <clears throat> perhaps you get a newspaper from your hometown. And I don't know if you're like a lot of people I know, but you may turn to the obituaries. I mean, you know you're not in it, but you just want to check. Maybe someone that you know is. But how about if you turned in your, in your newspaper to read an obituary that said, Jesus of Nazareth, a 33-year-old rabbi, died unexpectedly on Friday, April the 7th. He was preceded in death by his father, Joseph. And he is survived by his mother, Mary, and several brothers and sisters who live in and around Jerusalem and many very close friends. For several years, Jesus was employed locally as a carpenter, but approximately three years ago, he changed careers and became an itinerant preacher and a self-styled rabbi operating primarily in the areas of Judea and Galilee. 
Known for his inspiring sermons and his provocative stories, his message was ultimately one of simplicity. Basically, love God and love each other. He was especially active in working with those who lived on the poorer sides of society. And there are many circulating stories concerning his ability to perform miracles. Known as one who never knew a stranger, Jesus would often dine with eclectic groups. He enjoyed hiking and camping in the Judean hills and sailing with friends on the Sea of Galilee. A small private memorial service that was previously scheduled for today, April the 9th, has been canceled because, and everyone in this room can finish that obituary. All of us, I think, would like to read an obituary <clears throat> like that, one that doesn't just give a running commentary on the last years of a person's life, but instead revealed a new beginning of something that was so wonderful that it just defied description. I can imagine that just about everybody would love their obituary to read. <clears throat> the memorial service plan for so-and-so has been canceled because we've come together for yet another Easter service and we join the chorus of untold millions of people who over the last 20 centuries have made the amazing claim that Jesus of Nazareth triumphed over death. That first Easter, those who knew him best and loved him most, they didn't, they simply couldn't believe it at first. Just like us, they'd been around the block. <clears throat> they had seen death often enough to know that it proclaimed the end of a life, not the beginning of one. Just like us, they had experienced that empty, hollow feeling that comes over us when someone that we love dies. Just like us, they had read Elizabeth Cuba Ross's book that told us about the five stages of grief, how one travels from denial to anger to bargaining to depression and finally to acceptance. Everybody knows that death signifies the end of life. That's why we write obituaries and why we have memorial services. But there is a cemetery just outside the city limits of Jerusalem. And in that cemetery, the large round stone that covers that tomb has been moved and rolled away. And that same tomb is empty. And the women who went there to perform the rituals to preserve a body instead find young men whom they believe to be angels who said to them, he's not here, he is risen. Go and tell the others. <clears throat> One of the women that day at the tomb was Mary from Magdala, and this news has overwhelmed her. She can't make heads or tails out of these strangers or the things that they are saying, and so she wanders out into the garden where the aroma of those spring blossoms is heavy, and she begins to weep uncontrollably. A man's movement catches her eye, and he asks, why are you crying? And she says, please, if you're the one who has taken him, please tell me where, and I'll take care of it. And then the man says, Mary. And through the morning mist and the tears in her eyes, she looks up and sees a face that is lovingly familiar. Master, rabbi, Teacher, she exclaims, and runs to embrace him. And Jesus says, wait, don't hold on to him before I have ascended to the Father. But I want you to go and tell the others. And over and over again that day and in the days to come, the experience is repeated in Jerusalem, up on the Sea of Galilee, in people's homes, behind locked doors, on that road that leads to Emmaus. Grief and shock are interrupted by something no one could ever imagine. Jesus has triumphed over death. Now that's a rather nuanced thing to say. Jesus has triumphed over death. <clears throat> and I want to come back to that in just a minute. When I was a kid, when I read the Bible or memorized Bible verses, it was always from the King James Version because that was about all that there was. <clears throat> but now we have a wonderful array of Bible translations and paraphrases that help us understand the scriptures. But still, with all of those translations, 
It is still difficult to get the absolute meaning of an original scripture because we don't know how it was said. We don't hear the person who actually said it. And that can make an enormous difference in the interpretation of a particular scripture. Let me give you an example. If I say to you, I didn't say she lied, you have some idea of what I'm trying to communicate to you, and you get a certain meaning from that comment. But what if I say, I didn't say she lied? Well, it means somebody else have said, may have said she lied, but it wasn't me. How about if I say, I didn't say she lied? Well, that means I might have thought it. I might have inferred it but I didn't actually say it. How about I didn't say she lied. I might have said her crazy sister did, but I didn't say she did. <laughs> or how about I didn't say she lied. Oh, I probably said she exaggerated or she was just using hyperbole. At any rate, you see my point. The emphasis that is placed on a word in a sentence can have a dramatic effect on the meaning of that sentence. Now let's go back to that dramatic discovery on that first Easter morning. Jesus has triumphed over death. And if you put the emphasis on Jesus to say, Jesus has triumphed over death, what you have is a wonderful ending to a story that otherwise would have had a tragic ending. It would be like watching an old Lassie TV show. You remember that show on TV, don't you? I know many of you are old enough to remember it. <coughs> Lassie was this fantastic collie dog that every week had to save her owner, Timmy, from some dumb situation he'd gotten himself into. If there was a well to fall in, Timmy was going down. If there was a hand-painted sign that said, dangerous cave, do not enter, you knew Timmy was going in. <laughs> And if there was a circus within a 500-mile radius that had a tiger that escaped, Timmy was going to walk up on that tiger. He was an obnoxious kid who got himself into trouble week after week. But in the last scene of the show, every week, thanks to the fact that Lassie was braver than Timmy and a whole lot smarter, Timmy would have been led back to his parents safe and sound, led by that faithful and loyal Lassie. They would all look at the cameras. Some of them would say something cheesy, and Timmy would say, isn't that right, Lassie? And Lassie would bark, and everyone would laugh, fade to black. You know, for a lot of people, that's just like Easter. We're all extremely happy for Jesus. We're thrilled that all that bad stuff that happened to him is in the past. We're very happy that although he was dead, now he's alive. So everyone look at the camera, make Lassie bark, everyone laugh heartily, and let's go home and have some ham and an Easter egg hunt. Praise the Lord. For lots of people, Easter is simply a happy ending to the story of Jesus. Jesus triumphed over death. But what if we try to turn those words around? What if we change the emphasis and we say that Jesus has triumphed over death. Are you wondering if it really makes any difference if we say it like that? Well, I can tell you that it makes a difference to my friend Pat who buried her husband last Friday. It makes a difference to Donna who is suffering the depths of sorrow and loss even today. It makes a difference to everyone who has lost someone that they dearly love. It makes a difference that Jesus has won a victory over death. It makes a difference to those of you who are here today who are facing a serious illness that may not lead to your being healed. It makes a difference to all those parents in Nashville, Tennessee, who will face every day for the rest of their lives with an ache of emptiness in their heart. It makes a difference to all of us who care about the tragic and senseless death caused by humanity's inhumanity to each other. If Jesus defeated death, that's very good for Jesus. But if Jesus is victorious over death, then there is hope for us, and there is hope for our loved ones too. Go and tell the others, the risen Jesus said to the women at the tomb. And when he was in the garden, he said, go, tell the others. Why do you suppose that he asked them to do that? Because Jesus triumphed over death not only for himself, but for you.
for me, for everyone. Life now overflows with the hope after the inevitability of death does not signal the end of life, but rather the possibility of new beginnings for everyone. If Jesus defeated death, your failures can't bind you anymore. You can rise above them. You can be liberated from your past, and with God's help, you can find a new future for yourself. If you're here today carrying the weight of some burden from the past, or if you are carrying the burden of some great failure in your life, you can start turning that corner today because Jesus triumphs over death. And if Jesus destroyed the power of death, you can rise up above the limitations of body and mind and soul and with God's help find new meaning and even purpose in your weaknesses. If Jesus defeated death, you can be sure your sins can be forgiven. You can come home to the God who loves you and you can have a chance at a new beginning. All the things that are symptoms of death in our world can be eliminated and set right because Jesus has defeated death once and for all. We don't ever have to settle for endings, failures, dehumanizing things of this world anymore. We have been given the gift of new beginnings. So here we are once again at an Easter service. What are you going to take with you from the service that will go with you this week and the weeks to come? Well, I hope there are three things that you might take from it. First, I hope that you leave here today with a new understanding about death. While it is true that everyone dies, death is no longer an ending. It is a hope-filled beginning for yourself and for those you love more than anything in the world. Death cannot and will not hold us and our loved ones. And second, I hope that you will take a new understanding of yourself, not as a completed or finished person for better or for worse, but as a person who can change, as a person who can become and accomplish more than you ever imagined or dreamed. With God's help, you see, things that were wrong can be made right. Things that were broken can be made whole. Things that seem sad can be transformed into joyful new beginnings. And finally, above all, I hope you leave here today knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you more than you can ever comprehend. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has given every one of us the gift of eternal life. All we have to do is accept it. Jesus of Nazareth, a 33-year-old rabbi, died unexpectedly on Friday. If Jesus' obituary were printed in the Beacon or in the Wilmington Star News or whatever your hometown paper is, it might very well have begun just like that. How it will end will result in our understanding of Easter as a marvelous story with a happy ending as a blessed hope for all of humanity. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And now, would you turn in your hymnal as we sing together hymn number 203. May we please stand as we sing the hymn.
go from this place. And like Christ, who is raised from the dead by the power of God, walk in the newness of life through the power of our loving Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God.